switching gears a little bit, you know, we're in Joshua chapter 23 tonight, by the way. And somebody was talking about this before the service. Two weeks from tonight, when we next gather for this service, uh, we'll do Joshua 24, and Pastor Bruce will teach 24, and we'll have finished the book of Joshua. Somehow I feel a sense of pride about that. I hope you do. Christmas is coming. You know, the holiday season can be so great in so many ways. In some ways, it can be very difficult. And... Um, my wife and I are, are acquainted with some people right now, and this is a very difficult season for them because uh, it's a young family, a dad and a mom and three little ones, and the dad has cancer. And to be honest with you, at this point, if he makes it to Christmas, it's going to be a miracle. That's how sad it is. And my wife told me the other day that the dad in his hospital bed, had, had made time to, to talk with each of his three little children. I mean, they're all under 10 years old. But he made time to meet with each of them personally, to talk to them. Can you imagine what he said? What would you say in a situation like that? In fact, I, I really am interested to know. Let's just say, if, if, right, now, if, if right now tonight you knew that you were leaving this world sometime really soon, what would you say to those people whom you love around you? I, I, let's, let's dialogue about this. What would you say to them? If these were your last words to these people before you knew you were going to heaven, what would you say? Yeah. You tell them how much you love them. Yeah, for sure. What else? Let's run. I'm going home. I'll see you soon on the other side. Okay, yes. <laughs> If you know where you're going, right on, man. I'll, I'm going home and I'll see you soon on the other side. What else? Harold. Do the will of God. Do the will. Did you read my message before? Huh? Do the will of God. Okay, a good word. What else would you say? That's it? Yes, David. I'd be sure that they were sure that they were. Okay, make sure that they knew who Jesus Christ was and that they'd put their faith in him. Yeah? Yeah, Steve. Uh, don't be bitter towards God about this. He has everything. Ah, uh, that's good. You know, don't be angry with God that I'm going home now. What was the rest of it? He has everything in his hands. He's got everything in his hands. He's got a plan. He's in control. That's good, man. I hadn't thought about that. Anybody? Rich? Uh, faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Right from the letter to the Corinthians. Anybody else? It's a heavy thought, isn't it? The reason I'm bringing it up tonight is we get a chance to, to look into Joshua chapter 23 tonight. And actually, what we're going to read, what we're going to study are some of the last words this wonderful man of God, Joshua, had to share with the leaders of his people. We're going to get insight into what this, this, this leader, this, this servant of the Lord, this, this one through whom God did so much, what he thought was important enough to say, to emphasize the things that he was concerned about that he wanted to share with those around him before he left. And I think as we examine his words tonight, they might impact what we might say. And maybe we need to make some adjustments as we look at this. And so tonight, as I mentioned, we're in Joshua 23. And if you're writing notes, which I encourage you to do, our subject is Joshua reminds, encourages, and warns the Israelites, and our objective is that we would remember, remain, and respect the Lord. Remember, remain, and respect. I hope you appreciate the alliteration on that. And before we jump into the text, I just want to pray as we always do, and let's ask God to speak to us tonight. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for um, just another chance to come together as your people, your children, in your presence to seek you, we believe that you speak to us through your word, through your spirit, through one another. We want to hear from you tonight, Father. So I just ask that by your grace you would give us humble hearts now to hear what we need to hear from you and uh, that you would change us, Lord. Make us more like Jesus, our Savior, tonight. Um, and I do just want to pray for this family that I mentioned right now, Lord. 
I just pray for your mercy on them. I keep praying that. I don't know what else to pray. Please have mercy on them, Lord. So we lift them up and we lift this time up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. A uh, little context. I decided to go big picture tonight with the context. We all know way back at the beginning, God created everything, including this planet that we walk in, including the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, right? And he placed them in this perfect place called the Garden of Eden, and they had an uninhibited love relationship with God. It was perfect, just as God designed it to be. But then Adam and Eve disobeyed, right? And their disobedience brought this thing called sin into the world, which did so much damage. Primarily, it separated them from God. They no longer had this uninhibited love relationship. There was a division now because of that. But God had a plan all along. And we read in Genesis chapter 12, God chose this man, Abram, later called Abraham, and he chose Abraham and he told him, I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to take these people and I'm going to bring them into this promised land that I'm going to give to you. And of course, God's plan was that through this special people, he was going to raise up one who would be Messiah, who would be the Savior of the world, who would be the answer, the solution to the sin problem so that we could once again be connected to God and our sin would be washed away. And remember how God's people found themselves in slavery in Egypt for 400 years and God raised up a man named Moses to deliver them. And he took them out into the desert and there God gave them his law, his rules, his guidelines for how he wanted us to live, how he created us to live, and how we could have a relationship with him. And Moses led the people right up to the promised land, but he never got to go in because of a sin he committed. And then God raised up this man we've been reading about, Joshua. And God chose Joshua to be the guy who would bring his people, his chosen people, into the land, the promised land, right? And that's what we've been learning and reading all about this last few months as we go through the book of Joshua. They went into the land, God conquered their enemies, they took possession of it, and they divided it up, and everybody got an inheritance, in the promised land. And now tonight, we're getting near the end of Joshua, and he's getting old. The dude's old now. He's getting tired. And his greatest passion, as we're going to see, is he doesn't want God's people to drift away from serving the one true living God. And so these words, tonight and then in two weeks in chapter 24, this is the heart of this man, Joshua being poured out to these people and doing everything he can before he leaves this planet to make sure they keep seeking the Lord. And so with that in mind, let's read Joshua 23. And you know, if you don't mind, why don't you stand with me, just out of respect for the Word of God. We're going to read the whole chapter. Fortunately, it's not one of those 99-verse chapters. There are only 16 verses. Joshua chapter 23. Follow with me as I read it out loud. Now it came to pass... A long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. In verse 6, Therefore, Be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. Unless you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, 
For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Verse 11, Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. 14. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Therefore it shall come to pass That is, all the good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you. So the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. You may be seated. Let's talk about this a little bit. So the, again, this is Joshua's final words to these people, and he's going to encourage them to do three things. And you might want to write them down because these are three things that we need to implement into our lives as well. And the first thing that Joshua encourages the leaders of the people to do is to remember the Lord's faithfulness. To remember how faithful The Lord has been to them. You see, in verse 3, he says, You have seen all that the Lord your God has done. And in these verses, he basically reminds them of four different things. The first thing he says in verses 3 to 10, he says, The Lord your God has fought for you and is still fighting for you and is going to keep fighting for you. He's the one that has fought these battles for you, He's the one that's defeated the enemies not you. And also, he is the one that has given you this wonderful land, this promised land, this land of milk and honey as an inheritance. It's not something you earned. It's not something you won. It's not something that you deserve. But your God has been faithful to give you this land as an inheritance. And in verses 5 to 9, Joshua reminds them that God has expelled your enemies, and he's going to continue to expel them. You see, there were still some enemies in the land. They had general control now over the land, but there were still pockets of resistant, po- po- resistance, pockets of these people that they were going to need to drive out. The individual tribes, once they were settling into their own area now, were going to have to drive them out. There's still work to do. And Joshua was saying, God has been faithful, and he's going to continue to be faithful to drive those enemies out as you obey him. And I just love verse 14. I'm going to read it again. You know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Not one thing has ever not happened that God has said he would do, or that he's promised. Not one. And so the first thing Joshua's doing is he's saying, you guys, I want you to remember how faithful God has been. Don't forget it. One of the best ways that they and that we can stay close in abiding in the Lord is to remember what he's done in the past for us. You know, as followers of Jesus in this crazy world, we're going to face hard times. Some of us are facing them right now. We're going to face temptation. Some of them are struggling. Some of us are struggling with them right now. And as natural people who tend to drift away from the Lord, we need to constantly remember, we need to constantly remind ourselves of how the Lord has been faithful in our lives. It's so easy to forget, isn't it? And we tend to focus on the the negative things, on the hard times, on the sad things, on the losses, on the things we don't have, on the things we wish we had. And we forget just how faithful God has been and all he's done in our lives. You know, years ago, 
my wife and I went through a, a Bible study curriculum called Experiencing God. We've actually been through it a few times. If you've never been through it, I dare you. It's like every time we go through it, God does radical things in our hearts and in our lives. But one of the things, one of the many, many great things that we learned was about this concept of spiritual markers. It's the idea that when God does wonderful things or significant things in our lives, we need to do something to remember them. Whether it's writing them down in a journal or building a monument to them or getting a tattoo, I don't have any, but whatever it is, to make sure that we remember these significant things that the Lord has done in our lives. And I've done that over the years. I've written them down and I have them in my brain because every once in a while, I hit a wall, start to feel discouraged, start to feel de depressed, start to feel like, where am I going? What am I doing? Why am I here? And I can pull that list out and just look back. And when I'm wondering, God, where are you? I can go, oh yeah, that, that was definitely God. You know, my salvation. Uh, man, anytime I need to remember who God is and that he's there, I just go back to the fact that I'm even saved. The time when God took me from pursuing a whole different secular career and brought me into this whole thing we call vocational ministry. I started off as a, a part-time worship leader. That was a really significant time. I had to make some huge decisions and, and let go of some things that people thought were crazy. But I know it was God. Another time when we, we were at one church and we felt called to go with some other people to go plant a new church over in Moore Park. It's another huge thing. It just uprooted my whole family. We changed our whole lives for that. There have been a couple times we had to make changes in churches, which are significant changes, you know? But God has always been faithful. I've seen him. And these markers, these, these, there's markers in my mind and my heart reminding me God has always been there. He's never let me down. As long as I've sought him and surrendered to him, he's always taken care of me and my family, always. And that strengthens my faith. So what about you? Can you think about times in your life when you know God did something? Or when you know God provided? When you know God worked something out that looked impossible or whatever it is, do you have those significant times in your life? You need to know those. And if you don't have them written down in some form or fashion or recorded in some way, you need to do that. So when you hit those dry times, man, when you're out in the desert and you're wondering if God is even there, if he even cares anymore, you can look at those and be reminded. I'm just telling you, it's going to happen. You need these. And that's one benefit of living a little longer. <laughs> I got a little longer list now, you know? Been through a few different kinds of things, and God's always been faithful. What's so sick is that I still doubt and freak out sometimes. It's like, come on, man, look at all God's done. We need to be reminded. That's what Joshua was doing with the people. You guys, don't forget where you came from, who delivered you, how you got through the desert, how you brought here, who brought you into the promised land, who's conquered all these people. Don't forget how faithful God has been. You know, even when uh, they crossed the, the Jordan River to go into the, the Promised Land, what'd they do? God told them to get these stones and make these pile of memorial stones. It's biblical, this idea here. Just to remember who he is and what he did, his faithfulness. I love what David says in Psalm 77, verses 11 and 12. David man after God's own heart. He says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your works of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. David's doing this. He's reminding himself of God's faithfulness to strengthen his faith and to keep him on the right path. And so, again, Joshua chose in some of these final words to the leaders of his people, to remind them, don't forget how faithful God has been. That's really important, and it's a wise thing for us to do as followers of Christ today. But that's not all. The second thing that Joshua encouraged, 
the people to do is to remain in the Lord's will. To abide in the Lord, to do what he said to do, to continue to follow his path. Joshua encourages the leaders to continue to serve the Lord. Look at verse 6 again. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. This is the instruction book. Even way back then, they didn't have the New Testament. We do now, but they had the word of God, the law of Moses. And way back in Joshua chapter 1, that's what God told Joshua to do, to follow my book. That's how you're going to stay right with me. And it's so funny, it says here, be very courageous. And that's exactly what God said back in Joshua chapter 1. You know, the world today and people in the world, you probably heard this, people sometimes talk about religion or faith as kind of a crutch. You know, when you're weak and if you can't handle life on your own, you know, lean on religion and stuff. Let me just tell you the reality. The reality is there's nothing more radical there's nothing that takes more courage. There's nothing that's harder than to decide to surrender your life and to follow Jesus and to take up your cross, right? And to, and to make this the, the guidebook of your life and to believe in the God you can't even see. There's nothing more courageous than that. And that's why he wrote here, be courageous and to know and do the word of God because it takes courage. And fortunately, we don't have to get the courage in and of ourselves. I'm a wimp, but God's not. And I got God in me. So do you. So we can ask him for the courage and the strength and the faith and whatever else we need. The second thing in verse 7, look at verse 7. The second thing he says is, You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them or bow down to them. In other words, avoid getting involved with the world around you, these peoples around you. Stay away from what they're doing. Don't get sucked into their culture and their ways. Don't worship their gods. You know, and in our culture, this whole notion of idolatry seems kind of foreign. You know, I mean, we don't have statues that we go around bowing down to or throwing money at or something. But you know, we got idolatry just as bad as any culture ever did. It's just different. There's wealth, celebrities of all kinds, athletes, musicians, actors, politicians, possessions, the nice houses, the nice cars, beauty, or handsomeness, whatever, you know, success and power. These are our idols. And so this temptation is just as strong for us, maybe more so today, to avoid getting pulled away from God and sucked back into this world and its ways. And that's what Joshua is warning, encouraging his leaders not to do, to stay away from the way they live. And the third thing he says in verse 8, but hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. He's encouraging them to abide in the Lord, to stay in, to cling to, hold fast to the Lord. And, you know, that points to the fact that it has to be intentional. Left to our own devices between the, the pressure of this world and the evilness of our enemy and our own sinful flesh, we will always naturally move away from God. And so we have to be intentional. We have to, it's like swimming uphill for 80 years or however long you live. But that's what we got to do. There's no tread in water. You're either moving forward closer to God or you're moving away from Him. And I speak as one, I've experienced both, and maybe you have too. We have to be intentional. We have to cling to him. We have to abide in him. And the last thing that he encourages them about is way up in verse 11. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Take careful heed. We have to watch ourselves. We have to pay attention to what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. We have to be aware of what's going on in us. We have to monitor ourselves. 
We have to monitor ourselves. We can't rely on other people to do it because they don't know what's going on in our head and in our heart. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So regularly, we need to be asking ourselves, how am I doing? Am I excited about God? Not that it's all about emotion, because it's not. But am I pursuing the Lord? Am I being intentional? Or am I drifting away? What's going on in my head and my heart? We need to cling to him. And I love how he says at the end of that verse 11, that you love the Lord your God. We always got to remember, that's the point of this whole thing, is love. God loves you and me. And God wants us to love him. It's not about following the rules. It's not about being a good person or doing all the right things or accomplishing great things. It's about love. He wants to be in a love relationship with us. Now, Jesus said we prove our love by our actions, by our obedience. But it's not about the actions. It's about love. That's why he created us. So Joshua encouraged these leaders to persevere to continue to do what the Lord had commanded them to do from the beginning in order that they could be obedient to his will and to remain in his will, remain connected to him. He didn't want them to backslide. That's the churchy word, to backslide, to fall away, to drift away. We've got to be careful not to do this. You know how it starts? You, You start to come to church a little less frequently. Or you you drop out, you kind of quit going to your community group, right? And you start sleeping in a little bit later and not getting up like you used to to read the Bible and pray. You don't have that good quiet time in the morning. And suddenly, then you're not around other Christian people as much as you used to be and you you find yourself around some other people in the world, which doesn't have to be a bad thing if you're going to be a witness to them, but instead of being a witness to them, they're kind of having more of an effect on you. And you find yourself thinking thoughts that you used to not struggle with and kind of letting them linger instead of cutting them out of your mind. And You find stuff coming out of your mouth that kind of surprises you at first, but after a while, you start to get a little more comfortable with that. And then you find yourself maybe even doing some things that you know are sinful, but you make excuses for allowing those things into your life. And before you know it, you've drifted away from God. And you're disconnected. And you've backslidden. I can describe this so well because I've experienced this in my life and and I know a lot of you have too. And we have to be careful of that. That can happen to any of us at any time. That's why we have to be so intentional. We're meant to be in this world but not of this world. In this world to be lights, right? To be witnesses. But not of the world in the sense of participating in it and making it our home. We don't belong here. That's why James wrote in James 1, we're supposed to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And so, I challenge you right now to think about your life for a moment. Are you allowing things in your life that you know you shouldn't? Or maybe have you let some things that you know are so important to to nurture that relationship with God, are you allowing some of those things to slip away and to grow cold? Be honest with yourself. And let me just say, as a word of encouragement, it's dangerous. You're playing with fire. You're gambling with your soul. And if you are, I hope the Lord is convicting you and encouraging you. He's calling you back. Confess it to him. Ask him for help. 
for strength, for faith. And so to keep from, from this backsliding, falling away, rebelling, and to assure that we'll remain in the Lord's will, we've got to implement these things that Joshua is encouraging his leaders to do. Obey the Lord. Avoid getting involved in the world. Abide in Jesus every moment. And watch ourselves. Pay attention to how we're doing and what's happening. The last thing we see that Joshua encourages the leaders to do, and this is an interesting one, is to respect the Lord's anger. To respect the Lord's anger. Let's just reread verses 12 and 13. Look at 12. Joshua says, Or else, if indeed you do go back, and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them, and they to you. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your side and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Jump down to 15. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all the good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant, the agreement of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. Joshua says, listen, if you disobey, if you fall away, if you rebel, if you turn your back, one, he's no longer going to give you victory over your enemies, as he's been doing. Two, instead, he's going to allow harmful things to come upon you. You know, the idea of thorns in your eyes, doesn't that sound harmful? (laughs) That one grabbed me. And then it says in verse 16 that his anger will burn against you and you will perish. Joshua wasn't holding back his punches here. He had all this positive stuff at first and now he's getting to some heavy stuff. He wants his people to know this isn't a game. This is life and death. This is serious. And the Israelites, you know, they've seen God work. They've seen God destroy people, wipe out villages, completely dominate entire nations of people. They have a little perspective, different perspective on the power and the anger of God than we do. And so besides wanting to remind his people of the Lord's faithfulness, he wants to instill in them a godly fear. Because he knew that this would be motivation for them to remain faithful and obedient to the Lord. Now, I realize it's uncomfortable. We don't like talking about the anger of God, the wrath of God. We don't talk about it that much. The idea of fearing the Lord. But let me just clarify that the anger of God is not like our anger, okay? His anger is perfectly holy and righteous and just. It's still anger. It's going to come down, read the book of Revelation. But it's not a sinful human anger. It's the anger of a holy, righteous, perfectly just God. I I did a little check-in today. The phrase, the anger of the Lord, is found 30 times in in the New King James Version. If you make it, the wrath of the Lord is another 14 times. The wrath of God, another 10 times. That's uh, over 50 times. And there's some verses, Romans 1.18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the, uh, the truth and unrighteousness. The wrath of God. Ephesians 5.6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, sin, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It's there, it's real. You know, we don't like to talk about it. God talks about it quite a bit. <laughs> See, God is love. We know that. That's a very popular concept. But God is also holy and righteous and just. 
and therefore he hates sin. Sin makes him angry. Again, I want to clarify, when we sin, we confess our sin and repent. It's not like he's angry at us about that, but he's angry with sin that goes on, sin that rejects his son, sin that rebels against his will that goes on and continues. He hates it, and it makes him angry. And he promises that one day he's going to punish it. Sometimes we want that to come now when I see stuff that happens in the world. It will happen in his time, in his way, but it will happen. And so the point of this is what Joshua is wanting to instill in his people and the reason the word of God talks about the fear of the Lord and the anger of God because he wants us to respect him, to fear him in the sense of hating sin to respect his holiness, to realize that he is coming back someday and to know that one day he will pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his son and chosen sin and rebellion instead. Now just to remind us, let me share a couple nice verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight, you've put your faith in Jesus, you don't have to worry about the wrath of God. Right? Let me give you one other one. Romans 5, 9. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, Jesus' blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So as believers in Christ, we don't have to worry about this personally. We should still have concern for those who don't know him yet. And as a loving father, he still allows us to experience consequences of our bad choices and our sin and our rebellion. Hebrews, read Hebrews chapter 12. So uh, let's just brainstorm for a second because I realize this is a, an interesting subject. Why does the Lord want us to fear him? What do you think? Why does God want us to fear him? Yes? Okay, because he truly has the power to discipline, correct, and judge what we do. Yes, he truly does. Yes? Because he knows what's best for us. Because he knows. What was the second half? Oh, yes, because he knows what's best for us and he wants to protect us from things that he knows are bad for us. To discipline. Through that fear comes a proper perspective of our relationship with him, that respect, a discipline, and a humbling. Yes, yes, yes. John. Well, yeah. I mean, that's one thing that keeps us from sin is, is understanding who he is and realizing how much he hates sin, that he's going to judge it. What else? We're getting rolling a little bit. It's a, it's a wild question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> oh, we don't want to disappoint him. Okay, yes. Anybody else? Grant. He wants us to have a holy and loving relationship with him. Yes. Let me ask you something. Did you ever use fear to um, guide your children when you were parenting them? And did you love your children when you did that? In fact, sometimes when we really love them, we really want us to don't run out into the street without me. Right? God is not trying to use fear to drive us away from him. It's just the opposite. He wants us to respect him and who he truly is to draw us to him, to help us realize that we are sinners, that we have a problem, that we need a Savior, that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and repent of our sins and be born again and so we can appreciate how holy and awesome he is and how sinful we are and the amazing grace that it took for Jesus to come and reconcile us with him and how much he loves us and wants to be in relationship with us. Amen. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. So this whole thing of fear in God, it's a good thing. 
That's why it's all over the place in the Bible. That's why Joshua is reminding the leaders of his people that they need to fear God. They need to respect his anger. Because just as he's faithful to bless them and all the things that he said he would if they obeyed, he is going to be faithful to allow them to suffer all the terrible consequences that he warned them about if they choose to disobey and rebel and reject him. Because that's who God is. He's faithful both ways. That's good parenting. So Joshua's final words to the leaders of these people, and realize these are people that he loved. He'd been leading these people for a long time. He'd been with them for decades and decades. He'd sacrificed so much. These are people he cared for. He wanted the best for. His final words were, you guys, I want you to remember all that the Lord has done for you. And you need to live your life for him and and, and stay in his will, obey him, know and do his word. And you need to have a holy fear, a respect for him and for his anger, for his wrath, for his consequences. These were the words in his last days, maybe months, nobody knows for sure, his last days miniature little season of time on earth that Joshua felt were the most important things to say to the leaders of his people, of God's people. So I've been chewing about this, chewing on this a little longer than you have, right? And I've been thinking, if I was suddenly lying on my deathbed in the hospital and I had my family, my wife Deanne, my son and son-in-law, and my daughter-in-law, and my, my daughter and my son-in-law, my two grandchildren, our moms. These are the, the top ten I have in my life. You know? If I had these people around me and I knew that I was going to be leaving soon, I, would, I think if I said these words, I'd feel good about that. You guys, Before I go, I just want you to remember, and after I'm gone, remember how God has always been so faithful to me, to us. He's never let us down. And after I'm gone, more than anything, I want you to keep seeking the Lord and loving him and serving him and obeying him and and making him your life. And don't forget that he's a holy, righteous God, and he hates sin, and that he's going to judge someday. And people need to know. People need to know. I would feel good if those were my last words to my loved ones. Would you? And I hope and I pray and I trust that the people that we know and this man that met with his little ones, that those were some of his words to his kids too. But here's the catch. The catch. If these words are so important, they would, we want them to be the last words coming out of our lips to the people that we love the most before we leave this planet. Shouldn't we maybe say them now? and not wait until our last moments on this planet? Don't these things need to be proclaimed now? Yes, Yes, they do. That's why we're talking about them tonight. People need to know God is faithful. Look at all he's done. He sent his son, his only son, to die on the cross for your sin and my sin, to reconcile us again. And he wants us to live our lives for him now, his way. He's decided how it is what's right and wrong. He's shown us how we can be in love relationship with him. And one day he's coming back. And for those of us that know him, we can't wait for that day. But if you don't, if you don't, it's going to be bad. He's coming back and he's going to pour out his wrath. But you can get right. These things need to be said now to everyone as well as and especially to those closest to us. Amen? That's why God still has us here. And that's why you are here tonight, because God wanted you to hear this message, because he's got people in your life that need to hear this. And we need to humble ourselves and live on mission for him and be the leader like Joshua was to God's people. Are you up for that? All right, then let's pray and let's ask God to help us. Lord, so we thank you for tonight. So convicting, so encouraging, Lord. We do praise you for your faithfulness. 
And Lord, we need your help to be faithful to you and to abide in you and to to live according to your word. Please help us, Holy Spirit. And I do pray, Father, that you would instill in each of us a holy, a holy, healthy fear of God. That you are a holy God. You love us and you are a heavenly Father, but you are God, our creator, the sovereign king of the universe. And let these things motivate us, Lord, to love you and to live our lives for you and to live our days on this planet to glorify you, to please you, to fulfill your plan for our lives and to proclaim the good news, the fantastic news, the unbelievable news about what you did sending your son and Jesus what you did coming into this world and giving your life on the cross, especially this time of year at Christmas when it all started when you came as this little baby. Lord, let the gospel be proclaimed clearly in our lives and in this season. We just praise you and we thank you for everything. And it's in Jesus' name we pray to his glory. Amen.